All right, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, and uh, on uh, behalf of the UT Austin uh, uh, Portugal uh, program, I uh, would like to uh, uh, welcome everyone to the masterclass um, on the next generation batteries. And uh, we have a, a great um, series of uh, uh, invited speakers today. Uh, uh, Professors Guyu Hua from UT Austin, Professor Maria Elena Braga from the University of Porto, Professor Manthiram from UT Austin, and Professor Sinancho Lanceros from the University of Minas. Uh, and we, um, uh, this is going to be a great discussion on, uh, on a great topic uh, that is uh, currently of, uh, of importance for uh, the uh, uh, alternative energies and also the uh, uh, the sustainability of our planet. So, um, uh, with uh, I would like to uh, start by um, and actually introducing uh, uh, the uh, first speaker. That's going to be uh, uh, Professor Guyua. Uh, he earned his uh, PhD degree in uh, chemistry from Harvard in 2009. Uh, after graduating from the University of Science and Technology of China in chemistry in 2003, and then he spent about three years at Stanford. Um, and after that, he joined the Faculty of Mechanical Engineering at the University of Texas, Austin, as an assistant professor of material science. Uh, his research has been centered on rational design and synthesis on functional nanomaterials, fundamental understanding of their chemical and physical properties, and development of large-scale assembly and integration strategies to enable their technology important applications in energy, environment, and sustainable technologies. Okay, so um, the next next uh, presentation will come from Dr. Maria Elena Braga. Uh, so she's an associate professor and the head of the engineering physics department at the University of Porto, uh, has a degree in solid state physics and material science and a PhD in materials and metallurgy engineering. Uh, from 2008 to 2011, she worked as a research scholar and long term staff member at Los Alamos National Laboratory in the United States, where she uh, first started working on crystalline solid state electrolytes. And then in 2014, she discovered a lithium and sodium based glass electrolyte that led her to collaborate with uh, Nobel Prize winner John Goodenough at UT Austin from 2016 to 2019 as a senior research fellow. Uh, so really excited uh, for our next talk. Um, so Maria Elena, do you want to go ahead and get sure. started? Uh, good afternoon or good morning. Uh, thank you for your introduction. I'm not the head of the physics department, engineering physics department anymore. This was last year. Um, but um, anyway, I, I, will, I still belong to the engineering physics department. So uh, today I would like to talk about energy harvesting and storage and structural complex systems at their service. And I would like to thank to, to thank to UT Austin uh, program and also to Paulo for this invitation. And uh, uh, I want to, to, to give a special thanks to the people that uh, with whom I have been working uh, lately. And uh, so they are listed all, all here. Um, so we have heard from Guahu that uh, there's, there are problems that we need to solve in this world. And uh, some of these problems are energy problems. And uh, um, we can actually store, we can harvest energy during the day, for example, in a photovoltaic uh, panel. But we will always need to, to store the energy because, of course, we also need energy at night. So we need to have a ways, a means of uh, storing energy as well. But we need to store energy safely, efficiently, and also we need to store energy in remote places uh, where the grid cannot go. And uh, there is another problem that we have been uh, facing, which is the heat that uh, you, we all know all the, the problems with, with, the, with the climate change. So it would be very important to, uh, to harvest some of the wasted heat because 20%, um, uh, roughly 20% of the electrical energy that we use is wasted as in the resistors as uh, joule, uh, because of the joule effect uh, as heat. 
So if we could um, store some of that energy, that would be a, a, an important uh, contribution to, to the climate change. And especially in industri industrial, uh, uh, industrial uh, facilities, in households, and for example, even at data banks, uh, we all know that uh, with all these uh, new currencies that there's a lot of data banks and they really need to harvest, they would need to harvest this energy not to contribute to the carbon footprint. The other thing is, of course, when we uh, create new solutions like new storing solutions, we really don't want to create another problem because um, Sometimes we, we, we use materials that are not sustainable or we, um, we don't, we, 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 with the solution, we, we bring new problems. So that's not ideal. And uh, so we are looking into uh, solutions, but solutions with sustainable materials and methods. So we kind of have to get out of the box and uh, instead of us being there, store in the box the energy, uh, but we, get, we have to get out of the box for new solutions, uh, as for example, those that Guahu has just showed us. Um, so some, some uh, means of uh, storing energy, uh, harvesting energy and storing energy, I'm going to talk about just for uh, pointing out some, some details. So we all heard about fuel cells and fuel cells have become uh, very important lately because the hydrogen that is needed for the fuel cell can be actually harvested um, using, using photovoltaic, so using the green energy. So the, the, the hydrogen uh, um, that is used in a fuel cell is, is uh, can be uh, uh, harvested, as I said, in a, in a sustainable way at this moment. So the, the fuel cells that were a little bit forgotten, they, they have been uh, lately uh, risen in, in, in uh, importance. And some of the electric vehicles actually are using fuel cells instead of batteries. So, um, and a, a big uh, a contribution from the government has been given also to implement the, the hydrogen uh, um, solution in, in, uh, in, um, for electric vehicles in, in, in many countries. But uh, as we know, fuel cells don't uh, uh, show uh, a very high power density. So they are the, 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 the lowest uh, in comparison with capacitors or supercapacitors and ba batteries, they show the, the lowest power density, but they show the highest energy density. So this is the Ragon plot, and actually Wahoo showed one Ragon plot uh, before. But what I'm just trying to uh, make you uh, uh, notice is that for a typical fuel cell, has only a voltage, an output voltage of 0 0.6 to 0 0.7 uh, volts at full rated load. This means that when you have low voltage compare in comparison, for example, with batteries where you can, you, in, in full load, they can be uh, 4.75, for example, in a, if you use LNMO, for example, uh, in this case, uh, uh, the, the cells really don't have a high voltage. The voltage is really low. So this means that eventually the current density is high. And this is really what happens. The current density is much higher than when we, we talk up in, with a, about a, a battery, for example. So, but fuel cells in terms of power, they have from 0 0.1 to 10, watt hour per liter, more or less. Um, and of course, they are plagued by other problems, which are um, they still use uh, uh, platinum catalysts, even if the, there are some iron catalysts uh, being studied since a long time ago. 
and they use, still use the Nathian membrane, which is rather expensive. So at least the, the, the proton exchange membrane fuel cells, there's many fuel cells that work at different temperatures, but the proton exchange membrane are the ones that kind of work until till uh, to uh, eight degrees, 80 degrees C, so more or less the ones that are used uh, at room temperature to 80 degrees. The other possibility of store energy is actually in flow cells. Flow cells need really uh, big space. They have and, uh, and uh, analyte and they have all these, uh, this is actually electrolyte. And uh, for example, in this case, the chlorine uh, is the, the anion that is exchanged through the membrane. The flow cells, as I said, are mostly used in the grid because they need a lot of space to, 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 be, uh, to be working. And uh, again, the voltage is really not high. And as you can see here in this in these, uh, um, table, the voltages are usually low, uh, usually low, much lower than a, a battery, uh, at least a lithium ion battery. Uh, and uh, uh, the again the, the the energy stored is in volumetric density is not uh, so high um, but then we have the photovoltaic cells the photovoltaic cells uh, are where uh, most of the harvesting is is being done today also of course in in with the wind uh, but the photovoltaic cells are uh, some of the most important harvesting uh, ways, uh, the ways of harvesting energy. And again, we have a voltage for each cell that is from 0 0.5 to 0 0.6 volts at 25 degrees. And these photovoltaic cells work, uh, the, the performance uh, worsens with uh, temperature. So at 70 degrees C, that is easy achievable uh, on the top of these cells, especially if you are in California, for example, or even in Austin in the, in the summer, um, the, the, the photovoltaic at that temperature do not work very efficiently. So they work much better at uh, uh, 25 degrees C, for example. And you can see here also the, the other problems are that um, when the, you don't have really a, a good sun, uh, when you have uh, clouds, then the, the power that uh, can be achieved is, is 10 milliwatts per centimeter and for 0 0.5. 33 volts. So for each cell, the 0 0.33 volts, of course, the energy is for all the cells. The, the, the current is for all the cells because the cells are usually 36 in series. So we see we cannot have everything. And as we know, and when we have low voltages, usually we have high density, high uh, uh, currents but eventually not very high uh, powers, um, power densities. So uh, now let's talk about uh, structural complex systems. Um, this year, the Nobel Prize of Physics was, a, was about complex systems and self-organization. What is that all about? What is that has what has that has to do with uh, what are we talking about here with batteries and energy storage and uh, and and energy harvesting? How can I, can we relate that uh, to what uh, we are is is the theme uh, the subject of these of these these master class? Actually, everything has to do with complex systems because our own evolution and everything that is a complex system, a complex system as we are, is involved in this self-organization because uh, um, we have, most of the systems are not, are non-linear and they are non-linear dynamics. They, they behave like a non-linear dynamics uh, uh, system. And as you see here, 
the, if this is uh, the energy, the potential energy, the system can be in a minimum, but if a perturbation, a perturbation occurs, uh, then another minimum can form. And this is, uh, and then this minima that forms will be the, the, the absolute minimum. And then we, we can have the system in, uh, in two possible uh, um, stable uh, configurations. And this creates all life and all types of complex systems and self-organization. And as you can see here, there's, there's a lot of uh, important uh, uh, titles that also have to do with, with, with batteries or ways of storing energy. Uh, but I just shown some of them here. So they, they also have to do with, uh, with the materials. So this year's Nobel Prize Parisi, for example, studied glasses and he studied spin glasses, for example. But the other uh, two uh, metrologists that, that, were, uh, that won the Nobel Prize with him, they studied, for example, the weather. So they studied uh, this type of nonlinear and attractors and how the, the masses, the, the, the atmospheric masses can flow from one place to the other, causing, for example, chaos and, and, and bifurcations and, and having some uh, minimum that are actually attractors. So this is everywhere and is also, it can be also in a, in a feedback system like the one we have with the, the electrolyte that we were using. So uh, this is the electrolyte that we have been currently using. So it's, we, we have uh, um, synthesized it for the first time. It's, it's, uh, it's based on sodium and it's a glass, it's a glassy material. And, but it's also a ferroelectric. So when uh, I'm saying that it's a ferroelectric, the ferro this means that it will spontaneously polarize. So when, I, when we make this kind of cell where we have a, a material with higher Fermi level and a material with lower Fermi level with a ferroelectric electrolyte in the middle, we have uh, of course, the entropy, the entropy increasing with time when we discharge, because obviously we have degradation of the interfaces and, uh, and other kind of, of uh, we have, of, uh, we, we lose energy when the ions move and because of the activation energy. So there is, a, there is obviously um, uh, degradation and, and Joule effect going on when we, when we, discharge the cell with a, with a resistor, for example, but because we have a ferroelectric material that uh, polarizes spontaneously, we can, we can also have, we also have self-organization because the material is polarizing while it is discharging because there is, in, there is a, well, the cell is discharging because there, at that point, there is an electric field inside because there are ions, positive ions, cations moving. So there is an electric field inside of the cell, which allows the material to, to polarize easy, in, a, in a easier way. So we kind of have this type of Poincaré map where we can have a, a, a positive feedback. So we have this charge over the one way uh, the external way, for example, if this would be the positive electrode and this, the, sorry, the negative electrode, for example, zinc, and this, the positive electrode, for example, carbon plus, car, uh, plus copper, we, we, we have uh, the external discharge, so symbolized here by the dot uh, arrow, but inside we have, we have a positive feedback. So that's how, even when we uh, uh, connect the, the cell to a resistor with a hundred ohm, for example, a thousand ohm, sorry. Um, we can, we start discharging, but then at a certain point at 0 0.8 volts in this case, the system still connected to the resistor. So still feeding with energy, the resistor starts to self charge. And then suddenly we have a catastrophic, uh, 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 increase in voltage 
and and we have a, st a stable a stable a stable point a stable energy uh, point a stable energy configuration for some time and then the system starts discharging again and then we have this again and the system can be at this new configuration at this new minimum for many many hours as you can see here and this is spontaneous and this can be done with a with a resistor outside we took it out of our uh, um, of our uh, uh, amplifier of our potential start just to see with our bare eyes with a with a with a voltmeter and just a resistor an external resistor and we still see here this and you are going to see it as well in, in at the end of my talk so we thought that this is a, a great thing and we can use this um, uh, for, for example, uh, cells in which we don't want to uh, change or to, to change the cell or, or to have to recharge the cell for a long, long time because, for example, they are in non-accessible places or in which they can be a part of the, the structure of, for example, a, a car or, um, or another type of, uh, of, for example, a building or even in the concrete or in a photovoltaic, uh, for example, on the other side and using the energy, the, the, the thermal energy to activate these uh, polarization of the ferroelectric and having the cell for example, in this case, you can see another example. We have this cell that started, that had connected to it a 26.6 kilo uh, uh, ohm resistor. And this is an external resistor. You can see the resistor. And uh, uh, instead of discharging, because it's feeding the resistor with energy, we have it charging for a long, long time. Uh, for 210 hours, so seven months already, this is still there in the potential stat, uh, connected in as a, as a voltmeter, and uh, we we still see it charging. So this is actually actually the equivalent circuit of what we have. This is our um, cell, but instead of having uh, an energy. Uh, uh, Instead of being wasting energy in the Joule effect, we actually have a negative resistor effect, which means that we increase the voltage with time. Because what is the, the effect that is uh, uh, competing here and it, that is winning here is the, the fact that the material, the electrolyte is a ferroelectric. So it's polarizing and maintaining the uh, increasing its polarization and allowing to have a feedback of uh, uh, current inside the cell. So um, you can also see here uh, that we have a very strange cell. This is, this is, a, this is like a coaxial cable in which uh, the dielectric material that usually is used in a coaxial cable, we, we substitute it with our electrolyte. And why did we do that? Because in this case, if we if we make this kind of uh, um, this kind of battery, the capacitance is actually calculated according to Gauss's law in a different way. So we can have a higher capacitance if we change these the the ra the, the ratio of the aluminum in regards to the ratio of the of the the electrolyte. So this is a way of having a, a cell that not only has very, can easily have a much higher capacitance, but uh, can also be a structural uh, beam and like that um, be used in to reinforce uh, many of the, for example, a car, for example, the, the, the ceiling or, or the, the doors of a car. As you can see here, we had to have two cells in series to light an LED because uh, the LED uh, needs at least 1.83 volts to, to, uh, to, to lit the green LED. But you saw here the current, the current was about from 40 when we initiate microamps to 58. This is just one cell. Um, 
But here we could also uh, have a much higher uh, uh, current, output current. We could have more than one milliamp because we have the external resistors, the resistor is nine, nine, uh, 0.98 kilo ohms. So we can have more than one milliamp of current uh, at this point. And again, we, we start, this is the, this is what the open circuit. And then here we put the resistor and you can see the initial discharge, just like a battery, a normal battery or a capacitor. Well, the capacitor will be just a straight line. And then it starts to suddenly self-charge. And then we have the catastrophic jump. And then we have a, a plateau for many hours. And as you see here, we have also a self-cycling effect, which is also part of this uh, self-oscillation, which is also uh, seen very many times in complex uh, systems. Uh, you can see that actually the, the, the frequency, it's, it doesn't change. It's one hour in this case. And it doesn't change for a long, long time. If you if you uh, zoom in these these parts, when it starts self charging, it also starts self oscillating, as you can see here. And the the frequency is actually one hour in this case, but it's not always the same frequency. It depends on the electrolyte, and it also depends on the geometric uh, uh, configuration of the cell. Um. You can see here that in flat cells, not like these ones, we could actually achieve a power that is higher than the photovoltaic power that I have shown before at 25 degrees C. So one idea is actually to use these cells to, uh, uh, re to, to uh, use the wasted energy from photovoltaic uh, uh, panels and uh, with that, uh, increase, contribute for the, the, the voltage increase and also the power and in, in those cells. And we could actually achieve much, uh, uh, much higher currents and powers at 184 degrees C with this kind of configuration of this kind of cell. So here I show you. Um, you have seen in the other in the other uh, um, in the other slides that there was self oscillation, and we don't want the self oscillation. We want the self charge, but we don't want the self oscillation, or at least we want uh, the 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 voltage to be kept constant. But well, it can it can go up. We don't we don't we want that, but we don't want the self oscillation. So uh, we have tried to to uh, uh, control, control that self-oscillation. So control the, the behavior that we don't want from the, the complex systems. But first we have done that, for example, in this cell that you can see here, but first we have made mechanical tests on these cells. And as you see, we increased the force to 1.75 kilonewton and we could uh, bend uh, 16 uh, millimeters, this cell. Um, and this cell was connected to another one to light a, a green LED. And this cell was always lit lighting the green LED and it actually held uh, better the, the force, the bending force than the, the, the shell without electrolyte. So with these, kind of cell, we could actually have this kind of uh, uh, energy, density, energy densities. And, uh, and bear in mind that this is the full cell with the, the, the carbon uh, polymer uh, part, which actually weighs uh, the difference between uh, six, uh, sorry, 21.6 and 15.2. But if we think that we only have a positive electrode with copper and a negative electrode that is aluminum in this case, if we 
com e fico com perda de, de energy, uh, for example, the energy density for the copper uh, uh, collector, which is also the positive electrode, we would have a, a very big uh, uh, energy density just for the copper, if we just accounted for the copper. Of course, in the cell, we should account everything. And this is, these are the, 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 the energy densities that we have for the full cell, including the shell. Um, but as I said, we want to, to um, we want to control the self cycling. So what we have done was charging like a peak free minute charge. This cell, after being bent, uh, still seeing if we can still use it. So we, we and we were free minutes charging and then discharging for the full day. And as you can see here, we 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 achieve full plateau and straight plateau and then we would charge for three minutes uh, and then as you can see here we can even when we when we this when we um lower the 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 temperature as you can see here the cell can still recover and relax and recover and increase the the current after some hours so uh, actually some cycles so each of these cycles are one day, 24 hours. So uh, last but not least, I'm going to show you a movie. Just um, this is just the, the idea. This is actually Volvo idea. This, this was in, they, they, they started to make structural cells uh, with, a, with a project that was paid by the European Union and uh, and they, they had this uh, car in, the, in their site, in their site, and this the idea is actually to make to put the cells in the in all these uh, uh, places that are not being used for uh, you know they have to be there they are structural but they are not being used to store energy so if we could not having the batteries in the middle of the car but just having the batteries in all the structure that has to exist, uh, that would be a, a big, uh, that would be a negative weight as, as Elon Musk and Tesla uh, said in, in, their, uh, in, their, in their battery day when they also talked about uh, using their cells, their new cells as, as, as structural cells. So I'm going to show you a movie where we will, we will see that we can also use uh, um, heat, for example, to, um, to uh, store, to increase the energy stored. And you, you will see the difference between uh, the, 20, the, the room temperature and then we are heating one of the cells that is connected with, to four LEDs in parallel. And you will see the difference in, in, in brightness uh, in luminescence, in luminescence between the, the, the cells at 25 degrees and the cells at uh, uh, 78, 98 degrees C. So uh, this, this is, so our ferroelectric electrolyte can be lithium or, or, um, or sodium based, it can be banded and these are the, the, the cells we can do just uh, with, um, with the electrolyte and different kinds of, uh, so this is one of the structural cells, and this is the what I want to say. So, so you'll see at 20 degrees C, and with the air blower at 98, from 78 to 8, we, we could increase the current 350 times, as you can see here, just heating up this cell to 98 degrees C. So this is the current at, at 98 degrees C. But it can also perform at minus 21 degrees, and this. And it has a big, big uh, uh, electrostatic capacity. You can see how with the cell turned apart, we can still light the LED. And this is the, ex the, exper the bending experiment. Sorry for all the flickering. This is very heavy. And this is our new lab. And thanks to uh, John Goodenough and, and uh, Professor Goodenough for his endowment and these institutions. And thank you very much for, uh, for hearing me. <laughs> thank you, Elena, for the great talk and again, uh, inspiring ideas here. Um, so I think the floor is open for questions. Um, 
uh, please the audience can of course pose their questions on the chat window or if any of the panelists if they are interested in asking questions they are welcome to and then we open the this chat right now i don't see anything here um, there are no questions there maybe maybe i could start with one which is this uh this temperature that you just talked about. So, um, so uh, I mean, is there any kind of limit uh, on the on the lower, on the higher side? I mean, it seems to me like uh, you know you keep increasing. If you go to four hundred or five hundred, you keep increasing the current. Is that correct or what no. is the, Where are the limits? <laughs> the limits is that uh, is the the transition from ferroelectric to paraelectric. Uh, so that happens at around 170 degrees C. So uh, for having this kind of behavior, you actually have the, the to have the ferroelectric regime. So below 170 degrees is the. It depends actually on the electrolyte. Obviously, you saw there 178, 180. But this is the, you, you, it depends a little bit of the electrolyte and how it's optimized. So um, mm -hmm. uh, it's around that temperature, 180 more or less, the transition. And uh, so, so, so no, we, and also it, it will melt at 260, so you cannot go <laughs> to, right. okay, to uh, 200 uh, to 400 point. degrees C. Right. And then maybe, uh, I mean, uh, uh, just a question which is related with that. I mean, uh, so in terms of the behavior, is this linear with temperature or is is nonlinear? Non nonlinear, nonlinear. Actually, all the behavior, all the behavior is based on nonlinear physics and nonlinear, uh, um, nonlinear with temperature. Even it has uh, regions where. Uh, where it's linear with temperature, but uh, if you look into all the the temperature range in which you can use it, it's it most of it it's non-linear. So has this been modeled or is is understood or or is still not understood exactly that kind of linearity versus non-linearity? Um, <laughs> there is still a lot of things to explore. Uh, we have. Good enough uh, used to say that I had a that I had a material to study all my life, <laughs> so I hope that's not the case. I I, I like to go to to study new new things, but this is actually being very interesting because we started in wanting to to make as it used to say uh, a real battery to not doing any real battery, <laughs> but doing other kind of uh, complex systems. Um, and so it's actually have been been fun. So, uh, um, but uh, there's still a lot to be done. So, uh, hopefully, hopefully we can do it together as well <laughs> in the right. future. Okay, I guess for the sake of time, again, thank you for your presentation. Uh, and um, I will actually, uh, there will be just, uh, let's just do a, a short break. We were scheduled to start at uh, 5.25, uh, but maybe uh, we can just give a few more, just a few more minutes. Maybe we, we can start at 5.30, uh, just a, a short break, and we will have uh, Professor Manthiram from UT mm -hmm. Austin. Uh, is the next speaker so uh, i will uh, i will see you there in about uh, five seven minutes or so okay see you shortly thank you so uh i guess uh welcome back uh to the second session of the master class and so uh, uh next uh, we will have uh, the presentation by professor Manthiram ram from the university of texas austin uh, Professor Matthew Ram graduated from uh, Madurai University in India uh, with a bachelor's degree and a master's degree, and then from the Indian Institute of Technology at Madras with a PhD degree in solid state chemistry. Uh, he's now uh, uh, directing a research group uh, in electrochemical energy technologies at UT Austin with about 30 grad students and postdoc uh, researchers. Uh, his current researchers is focused on rechargeable batteries and fuel cells uh, specifically. This group is engaged in uh, developing low cost, efficient, uh, durable materials for batteries and fuel cells and the fundamental understanding of their 
structured property performance relationships. And with that, I will pass the floor the, to Professor Manti Ram uh, that the, uh, he will uh, enlighten us uh, with his talk. Thank you. Bye. Good evening, good afternoon, and uh, good morning. So my talk is going to be focused on sustainable next generation battery chemistries. So when we think of a battery technology, we have to consider at least six major parameters. They are energy density, power density, how fast you can charge, discharge, cycle life, safety, environment, and cost. And along with that, we also would like to have fast charge capability as well as operation capabilities at low temperatures as well as reasonably higher temperatures. So among these parameters, which one we pay attention depends upon actually the application. For portable application, of course, you will pay a lot of attention to the user time, that is energy density. For electric vehicle, user time is or driving range is still important, energy density, but it's slightly larger battery. So cost, and it is on the road. So safety come into picture. When you go to grid, grid storage, it's really a large battery, so cost is a predominant factor. And you also don't want to replace it every three years, four years, or five years. So life is important, and then a lot of other, other things as well. So all these parameters are all these parameters actually are linked to severe material challenges. What kind of uh, structure they have, what kind of physics and chemistry they have. So materials are actually the bottleneck to achieve all these performance parameters. So from a materials point of view, I told, I mentioned a lot of parameters in the previous slide. So I have listed here how those parameters are linked to the real materials parameters. For example, when we say energy density, that is what kind of voltage we can get from that cell. And supposing if it is lithium ion batteries, how much lithium you can insert extract per unit weight or per unit volume. Power density depends upon the electronic conductivity of the two electrodes and the ionic conductivity of the two electrodes as well as the electrolyte. And when we say power density, that is the charging time, low temperature performance, and all those will be linked to that. Cycle life is determined by how the structure is reversible for the repeated insertion extraction and what kind of stability you are going to have with the material. Thermal stability is the one uh, related to fire hazard and safety. So that depends upon whether dendrites will easily grow on the anode or whether the cathode is release, going to release oxygen or what kind of uh, flammable properties the electrolyte has. So safety is not just one component, it is actually all the three guys, the two electrodes and the electrolyte. The environmental impact, what kind of material we use and what kind of processing we use. Cost is not just raw materials cost, it is all of the above. If I store more energy, I have to make less number of cells, so that makes, that saves money. So cost is everything. We do not, do not have any limitation on the type of battery. There are a lot of batteries one can think of. So I have listed here some of them, lithium ion batteries. Uh, we are all familiar. And right now, nothing to beat lithium ion batteries as far as the portable applications and the electric vehicles are concerned. Sodium ion batteries will replace lithium. So big cost advantage as well as abundance. Uh, you can avoid supply chain issues, but sodium ion batteries will always give a little bit less energy density than the lithium ion batteries. Multivalent ion batteries, that means your working ion is magnesium 2 plus, zinc 2 plus, or aluminum 3 plus. So when you insert one ion, you store three charges with the aluminum as opposed to one charge with lithium or sodium. So that's very appealing to get high energy density, but these will have two plus charge, they are three plus charge. So 
they will have a hard time to diffuse in the electrode material from one side to another side. Therefore, by the time you try to have a cell, I do not believe that you can get higher energy density than with multivalent ion batteries than either with lithium ion or sodium ion. Metal sulfur batteries, there is no oxide cathode here. It's just sulfur. And sulfur has 10 times more charge storage capacity than the oxide cathodes we have now. And sulfur is very abundant, a byproduct in the petrochemical industry. They want to get rid of it. So that is a good system in terms of energy density, abundance, as well as the, the cost. Sulfur can be in principle coupled with any of these working ions, but there are a lot of challenges. Sulfur is a bad uh, electronic conductor, bad lithium ion conductor. Therefore, you have to add a lot of carbon, you have to throw a lot of liquid electrolyte. By the time you do all those, the practic practical energy density will be pathetically low compared to the current lithium ion batteries, even though theoretical energy density is much higher. In addition to that, sulfur tends to dissolve in the ether electrolyte we use. Therefore, it crosses over from the cathode through the separator to the lithium metal or sodium metal anode. It's a mess. It is impacting both the cathode as well as the anode. With the sulfur, if you go to multivalent ion, the problems are even much more compared to lithium sulfur or sodium sulfur. Metal air batteries, very appealing. But if you have non aqueous system, there was a lot of hype 10 years back. I don't want to say who it is. If you have non aqueous system, the catalyst will uh, degrade the electrolyte. So that is not for practical application. You can have potentially useful aqueous battery systems but they are mainly for grid storage because the energy density will be low. Zinc air battery, for example. Redox flow batteries use solution chemicals as opposed to solid electrodes in the lithium ion batteries. Therefore, you can store a lot of solution liquid and then pump it. So that, that will again be low energy density. So mainly for grid storage, not for cars. But the main problem is you have liquid chemicals, so that will go from cathode to anode, anode to cathode, that is called crossover. That's a serious problem. All solid state batteries, the holy grail of the battery technology, it can give certainly better safety. If it is done right, thinner ele electrolyte, you can also have better energy density, but they suffer from poor interfacial charge transfer. If you have one solid and a liquid, you know it can wet very well. The charges can transfer from the solid to the liquid or liquid to the solid easily. When you have two solids together, how are we going to transfer the charge, lithium ion or sodium ion across that interface? That's a nightmare. That is a problem. And all the good electrolytes we have, solid electrolytes, they're all ceramic, they are uh, brittle. So how are we really going to manufacture a good solid electrolyte separator with large area, like the polymer separator we use in the current lithium ion battery. That's a challenge. So only time will tell how far we can go. So with that, we are on the current technology that uses solid electrodes and liquid electrolytes. They all became possible. The original concept was uh, demonstrated by Professor Whittingham in 1976 with the sulfide TAS2 cathode, but that limits the voltage to less than 2.5. All sulfides, selenides, will have voltage less than 2.5 volt or mainly less than 2 volt. Professor John Goodenough worked on oxide cathodes during the 1980s, so that increased the voltage from less than 2.5 volt to 4 volt, and that's what we have. And they were all developed in the 1980s, three cathode systems involving three visiting scientists or uh, postdocs, actually visiting scientists. They all had a job in their country. Mishishima came from Japan. They did lithium cobalt oxide and he left. Michael Thackeray came from South Africa. He did lithium manganese oxide spinel with John Goodenough. He left. I came from India 
we did the Pali Anayan uh, cathodes with iron demonstrating that the voltage can go up with the same metal ion. If you go from oxide to a poly ion, you can increase the voltage more than one volt. So these are the three systems, or these are the three cathode systems still under in play as far as, as, far as the practical cathode systems are concerned for lithium ion batteries. Now there is a lot of interest on cost, safety, and the sustainability. You can see here the first cobalt, expensive, unsafe, or more safety problem. Manganese, lower cost, better safety. When you go here, really much, much better safety. And iron is the most abundant and cheapest you can think of, which is already inbuilt. If you want to know more about how these were developed in the 1980s, you can look at this paper. Uh, I was able to uh, write that uh, last year. I think it already has some close to 300 or 250 some uh, citation. And I think last time when I looked, 69,000 people have accessed this paper, 69,000. And I don't know who they are. That's amazing to me. I think I never had a paper accessed 69,000. It's an open access journal. If you want to know nature communications, open access journal. So if you want to uh, get that article, you put this title, you will get it. You can see how all these things happen. It will be interesting. Those of you who teach courses, that will also be very useful article. Okay. So what are we doing in my group right now? Not all these years, you saw I showed here, even when I was as a visiting scientist at Oxford, iron, right? So sustainability cost is all the time there. So now cobalt is a big problem. Today cobalt is a problem. So we have been successful. We have been able to successfully eliminate cobalt from lithium ion batteries. Cobalt is really no, 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 no longer needed in lithium ion batteries. Today cobalt is a problem. Tomorrow, nickel may be a problem. Therefore, lithium sulfur, as I said, there is no metal, there is no mining involved here, just sulfur. And then day after tomorrow, lithium may itself become a problem. So you can think of sodium ion batteries, cobalt-free sodium ion batteries. In the long run, sodium sulfur, that is actually my dream technology. Sodium is plenty in the ocean. Sulfur is plenty as well. So that is one of the best technologies you can think of. And then of course, one can think of sodium organic materials batteries as well. So at least one successfully we have done it. Cobalt is no longer needed. These are all in the works. So we have to see this as well as here. These are all in the works. So that is what is going on in my research group currently. So let me show some data here. Right now, the commercial batteries use layered oxide cathodes with the formula LiMO2. That M is nickel, manganese, cobalt. Then the question is, why are we mixing three metals? Why can't we get just with one, manganese alone, nickel alone, or cobalt alone? I don't have time to go through uh, more detail. If you want to know the paper I mentioned, you can go through that. There are two major factors, the first two. Those are the most important ones. The relative positions of these redox energies with respect to the top of the oxygen 2p band, cobalt 3 plus 4 plus is overlapping. So you cannot get more than 50% capacity. So energy density with cobalt is limited. Also, if you charge more than 50%, you will pull out electron density from the oxygen 2p band. So oxide ion will be oxidized to superoxide, peroxide, and then oxygen gas. It will be released, safety problem. Manganese, 3 plus, 4 plus, well above the top of the oxygen 2P. That's why voltage is also lower with manganese compared to cobalt. So cobalt, man, manganese gas, good chemical stability. Cobalt has the worst chemical stability. The other factor is the relative stabilities of these ions in the octahedral site versus tetrahedral site, basic inorganic MC. You can calculate in five minutes with your calculator. The crystal field stabilization energy in the octahedral site and tetrahedral site for these ions, and you take the difference that will tell you to what extent 
these irs love the octahedral side that is here cobalt all the six electrons in the t2g band so it loves octahedral side it hates tetrahedral side what does it mean when you charge you create a lot of chemical imbalance in the lithium uh, plane this ion will tend to positive ion will tend to migrate from that six fold coordinated octahedral side through a neighboring tetrahedral side to this octahedral side cobalt doesn't want to do that because it hates tetrahedral side so that's a gift that's why in 1991 lico02 was the first cathode uh, sony used to commercialize the technology manganese very small so when you charge it manganese will tend to fall from that octahedral side through a neighboring tetrahedral side to the lithium plane so it will transform from the layered structure from this to a spinner structure voltage will decay car companies cannot handle so that's bad nickel in between in all of these criteria nickel is in between nickel can also be charged all the way to four plus of higher capacity that's why all the industries lg cam samsung tesla apple everybody is interested to increase the nickel content in these materials when you do that there are three problems cycle instability thermal instability air instability of the cathode that involves bulk on the surface of both the electrodes because the transition metals dissolve go from the cathode to the anode and degrade the anode so it's a system problem and that dissolution is actually related to the electronic configuration of the transition metal i have listed here some here actually it is related to the jan teller distortion or any time you have one electron in the eg band that will have dynamic or static instability that is instability or electronic instability and that is what causes a transformation from a cubic symmetry to a tetragonal symmetry that is called jan teller distortion so with that whenever you have these ions having one electron in the eg band they will undergo charge ordering for example if you have manganese 3 plus it will tend to charge order manganese 2 plus and manganese 4 plus to relieve that uh, the dynamic or static instability and if you have trace amount of proton in the alkylite that will form hf and that will uh, that will protonate the oxide ion and will lead to manganese dissolution if you look at cobalt 3 plus all the electrons are in the t2g band there is no electron in the eg band so cobalt is the best in terms of metal ions not dissolving so that tells you why cobalt is so good why the industry was starting with cobalt and still many people think cobalt is necessary but i can tell you cobalt is no longer necessary to achieve the performance so in my lab we don't want to just do something and just uh, have one more fancy publication that is not the goal no we want to do basic science research to solve critical problems so that means we make materials we don't buy we make materials the tang reactor the the right way right particle size similar to any other company makes like basf or sumitomo or ecopro any other battery chemical company makes we can make or better than that using a tang reactor we can do 10 kg per batch hydroxide precursor mix with the hydroxide heat it at appropriate temperature to get very nice crystalline materials as is that's one second we also make full cell with graphite anode so we can know the true performance of these cathodes as opposed to pairing with lithium metal then you don't know what's going on because there is infinite source of lithium metal or lithium ions from the lithium metal so that's two number three we do lot of analytical characterization of the electrodes after thousands of cycles using the facilities fantastic facilities at the texas materials at the texas materials institute at the university of texas at austin xvs top sins uh, tem uh, sem uh fib focused ion beam all those are very valuable i'm sorry i will not be able to show a lot of data but i will you'll see a few 
you see here when the nickel content goes from 33 percent 30 percent here to this is actually 33 33 33 uh, typo it should have added another three when you go from 33 percent to say 100 percent you see capacity increases energy density increases but capacity fades that's the problem and that's where we are trying to fix it now i talked about uh, cobalt in the battery, cathode is the most expensive, as you see here. From a material point of view, cathode is the most expensive. In that, cobalt is the most expensive. And also, cobalt is mined in the Democratic Republic of Congo in Central Africa. A lot of child labor, pollution. So it's a big concern. You see a lot of internet articles, uh, you see, because of that. So that's why cobalt has to be eliminated. So we, like I said, we have eliminated successfully. All of them have 90% nickel, excepting the last one, that is for a comparison. The NMA has 90% nickel, 5% manganese, 5% aluminum. We can co-precipitate all of them together. We can scale up. And if you see that, that performs as good as or better than some of the cobalt-containing materials. Usually, people will think rate capability will be charge discharge rate will be compromised. No, it is not compromised. People will, may think that the safety is compromised. No, it is not compromised. So, when we eliminate all the cobalt, we are not actually compromising any of the other aspects. We get good cycle life, and cobalt is no longer needed. We have also done extensive analysis after 1,000 cycles of the same cobalt-free material, NMA, the, 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 the red line, you see everywhere it is competing, or it is as good as or better than the cobalt-containing materials. We have done a lot of, like I said, the TMI, Texas Materials Institute facility. You can see, when, whenever you see here C, that has cobalt. No C means there is no cobalt. The material containing cobalt actually cracks a little bit more when you cycle for 1,000 cycles. They also have a more charge transfer resistance compared to the cobalt-free material. This is a top SIMS analysis. They have also more thicker SCA layer or cathode electrolyte interface layer form. I'm sorry, I will not be able to go through in detail, but it is not just getting performance alone. We can also understand what is going on with a lot of analytical characterization using the fantastic facilities at the University of Texas at Austin. Along with that, one TM, I put this because Paulo Ferreira will love this. This is cobalt, cobalt, no cobalt. As you see here, the rock salt, whenever these materials undergo degradation on the surface, they will form sodium chloride kind of phase. You can see here, uh, these have thicker, rock salt phase formation compared to the material that does not have any uh, cobalt. So NMA is really good. And we have a startup, Text Power EV Technologies. They are located in Houston. And they have a Series A funding. And they are in the process of commercializing this material. My next aspect is sulfur. As I said, the oxide cathodes 200 milliamp hour per gram, less than 200 milliamp hour per gram. With the sulfur, you can get 1,600, 10 times more. That's why a lot of interest. But the problem I already mentioned here, poor alkanic conductivity, poor ionic conductivity, polysulfate shuttle, and lithium metal degradation, all those are problems. Usually what people do, throw a lot of liquid electrolyte, a lot of carbon, that is no good. So we have this protocol, 5-5, and we also do polysulfate. 99% of the research in the literature is coin cell. With lithium sulfur, coin cell doesn't tell much. It will be misleading. So we make pouch cell. We can make pouch cell in our lab. And the University of Texas at Austin is also putting together a cell manufacturing facility, the Cockrell School of Engineering. So that is coming up. Next year, it will be that. That facility can make up to 30 amp hour cells. In my lab, I can make 100 milliamp hour or 200 milliamp hour right now, but that facility with a large dry room, you can handle, or you can make larger cells. So to understand better the sulfur, lithium sulfur batteries, we have adopted a configuration called anode free cell. What does that mean? You have Li2S cathode on the anode side, you have only the current collector. There is no free lithium. There is no graphite. There is no silicon. There is nothing. 
your lithium is already here you charge it it will be deposited here you discharge it that lithium will be used here so no excess lithium floating around so you can have a good understanding of what is going on with lithium plating and stripping you do not have to handle the uh, thin lithium foil all those along with that we have also done some molecular engineering of the polysulfide so that the polysulfide moving from the cathode to the anode does not harm the anode that much so with that again with using lot of xps as well as toxins you can see the lithium metal and anode free cell there is no free lithium the only lithium coming is from the li2s cathode as five cycle 40 cycle 300 cycles you can see more and more growth on the lithium metal and then one of the most important aspect is initially you have the polysulfides going from the cathode to the anode that's normal but it is beginning to get oxidized to sulfate containing species and that is keep on growing at the expense of the sulfide so that leads to thicker or very resistive stuff on the lithium metal anode that is consistent here with the xps data as well as toxins data so that is the problem so what do you do to overcome this tellurium is in the same group as sulfur but we have sulfur selenium tellurium tellurium is more towards metal so it's a metalloid so when we have tellurium tellurium substitutes into the into the polysulfide to form polytellurosulfide and that migrates to the anode to form li2tes3 on the sea layer on the lithium metal and that is much more robust that gives longer life for the an the lithium metal plating and stripping you can see day and night difference without any tellurium added to the sulfur cathode fades fast as soon as you put 10% tellurium it is much different finally the dream technology i cannot talk too much about this sodium sulfur this is remarkable i don't think there is any data like this in the literature so we are working on this uh, manuscript is um, uh, revised manuscript is under review hopefully it will be accepted any time and it will come out soon so people will know more about this now this is my last slide currently we are here 250 watt hour per kilogram if you really increase the nickel content that can go to 300 watt hour per kilogram if you replace the uh, graphite anode with lithium metal anode we can go to 400 watt hour per kilogram that is a battery 500 consortium led by our uh, pacific northwest national lab both me and professor goodenough are part of that consortium if you throw away all these oxide cathodes with sulfur that could go to 500 watt hour per kilogram Uh, sodium ion like i said you can think of these kind of strategies but they will always be a little bit less energy density than the lithium ion this is the holy grail uh, in principle it may be possible but only time will tell it's all under development finally this is my current group so i'm very grateful to all the people who have worked with me uh, about 280 students and postdocs over the years i'm very grateful to all of them uh, for doing all the hard work and that has made my uh, life at the university of texas at austin enjoyable and also i am thankful to all the funding agencies particularly the us department of energy is heavily funding us with various um, programs and this is a battery 500 consortium and then the nsf uh, army Samsung, CBMM, Wells, and Energy Institute. Brian is sitting. Brian Corgill is sitting here. Energy Institute is funding as a particular uh, anode program. So I'm grateful to all those funding agencies. Thank you. I'll be happy to answer questions. Thank you very much for your talk and uh, yeah, just all the state of the art uh, work on on batteries. Um, So I think the floor is uh, open for questions, uh, I guess, from the audience or from the panelists themselves. See if there is any question. Maybe, uh, maybe I could start with one, which is uh, maybe more general. Uh, you didn't touch much on it, but uh, when you compare the 
mobility applications versus stationary applications in terms of the lithium uh, materials. So uh, for the stationary, is that the lithium iron uh, uh, phosphate, the, the ideal one? And then uh, in related, related to that, uh, if you use the same precursors, because you now have mainly two precursors, uh, lithium hydroxide and, car and, and, and lithium carbonate. Uh, could you talk about this, uh, this kind of? So right now, the lot of focus is on portable devices as well as uh, uh, electric vehicle. For that, particularly for Western countries, they're always after longer driving range. So there is nothing to beat uh, the layered oxide cathode with graphite anode or graphite and silicon together. That is what is going on. So if you use the same technology for grid storage, it will be expensive. But there is also a lot of interest to use the lithium ion phosphate with the graphite anode for electric vehicle because of the cost concern, particularly in some countries uh, or even in Western countries where people need only a shorter driving range every day, people go from work to home. Uh, so, so that is possible, but LI, lithium ion phosphate stores less energy than uh, the, all these layered oxide cathodes. So at the end of the day, yes, the, there is a big cost advantage. Uh, so some applications can use that. For grid storage, yes, lithium ion batteries are highly cost concerned, high cost concern on lithium ion batteries. Of course, we have to develop other batteries, sodium ion batteries, potential. <clears throat> there are uh, flow batteries, potential, that's all happening. So at the end of the day, it's not just cost alone, it is cost versus performance. And that could also change over time because cost can fluctuate a lot depending upon, cost can change a lot depending upon how much is used. If you make, make if you use a lot of lithium ion batteries uh, for cars, then cost can go up. So I think it will be kind of cost versus performance will be the comparison that will be playing all the time as we move forward, it is very hard to say, but certainly lithium ion battery is a little bit expensive for grid storage. So and I don't the, know whether- And the, yeah. pre, thank you. And the precursors, uh, so uh, because you have the two, always uh, lithium hydroxide and lithium carbonate, uh, it depends, I mean, uh, of, the, of the type of material. So, uh, because okay. I'm asking that because there is a lot of discussion on mining and things like that, right? Yeah, so, when you have high nickel uh, content, uh, like I'm talking about, that has much higher capacity, energy density, for that you have to use lithium hydroxide because the synthesis becomes very challenging. You have to heat them at a very narrow temperature and lower temperature. So lithium carbonate, if you use it, reacting that around 700 is very difficult or challenging. So for that you have to use lithium hydroxide. If you make use of lithium, if it is lithium cobalt oxide, you can use lithium carbonate. If you use phenyl, LiMn2O4, you can use lithium carbonate. So all, all these, no, everything is not the same, right? When you change the composition, depending upon which one it is, you have to use either lithium hydroxide or lithium carbonate. Thank you very much. Uh, then I had LF, LFP, LFP, you have to make as a nano. When, may, when you make it as a nano, it has to be consistent. Lithium cobalt dioxide is the best you can think of. You get an uh, or middle school student, ask them, they will mix lithium carbonate uh, as well as cobalt dioxide, throw in the furnace, go home, come tomorrow. If, whether I do it or that middle school uh, student does it or my graduate student does it, it will give you the same performance. With the, with the lithium ion phosphate, it has to be nano, it has to be coated with the carbon. If it is not consistent, performance will be very sensi sensitive to that. So we cannot pay attention only to the raw material cost and abundance. We have to also pay attention to how they are made, how they are manufactured, tons and tons of material every day, and how reliable they are, what kind of quality check they need. All these will play into, right? It's one thing to do research in our lab, but it is another thing to do research or produce these materials in large companies, big companies. Right, upscale. Thank you very much. I uh, wonder if there is any question, Elena. Um, hello. So, uh, thank you for a very nice talk. Um,
from your point of view, um, do you you know that cattle, for example, uh, launched a um, sodium ion battery not a long time ago? From your point of view, do you think that uh, we will have in the future mainly sodium related batteries? Uh, so do you think that the sodium will ever substitute the, the lithium mainly? Of course, that we, we know that lithium is the best from the, the electrochemical point of view, but because sodium is much, more ex much less expensive and much, much more available, do you think that ever we will ha ever have just uh, mainly uh, sodium uh, for, for example, electric vehicles and grid? Okay, so let, let me give you a, give a broad answer. There are first there Sorry? are different there are different countries Western mm -hmm. countries Asia Europe mm -hmm. <laughs> North America South America Africa Australia different countries will need dif different requirements. And also the most important point is there is no one technology. As we move forward, there will be different technologies. And then we cannot put our eggs in one basket. For some mm -hmm. application, certainly, certainly, sodium ion batteries will be used. In some countries, driving range may be the, or for somebody, driving range may be the most important factor. And they may use lithium ion batteries for their car. Mm -hmm. For somebody else, driving range is not very important. They may use sodium ion batteries, right? So mm -hmm. it all depends upon what we need. And certainly as we move forward, it is not going to be, I'm talking about 10 years from now, 20 years from now, or mm -hmm. 30 years from now. I may not be alive, but we are not going to have one technology. There will be multiple technologies. Okay. Depending upon what we need, cost, abundance, mm -hmm. a lot of different issues. That's what is going to happen. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thanks. Um, Okay, well, I was just wondering if there was any questions. Um, I guess if not, uh, let me thank uh, uh, Professor Manthi Ram again, and then uh, we actually uh, uh, let's move on to uh, move on to the next uh, talk and last talk of uh, of, of today's masterclass. Uh, it will be given by Professor Sinencho from uh, uh, the uh, University of uh, of Mio, uh, um, and then is. Um, so he's uh, a bit of a, his background. He graduated in physics at University of the Basque. He obtained his PhD degree at the, at the Institute of Physics at uh, the University of Uzburg, Germany. And he was then a research scholar at Montana State University in the United States and visiting scientist uh, at Penn State and also University of Potsdam. Uh, he's now an uh, associate professor at Phys physics department at the University of Minho, uh, and uh, he's, he's currently on leave, and, um, and also an associate researcher at uh, INL uh, at the uh, International Iberian Nanotechnology Laboratory. Um, he's also, since uh, 2016, a professor at the BC, BC Materials, the BAS Center for Materials Application Nanostractors in Spain. And with that, uh, I will give the floor to uh, Professor Sanencho, and uh, I'm, uh, I'm looking forward to his talk. Please. Thank you very, very much, Paulo, and thank you very much, Paulo, and the organization for this kind invitation. It is really a pleasure to be here and, and to be talking to, to the next generation of great students and professionals in, the, in one of the most important areas nowadays, which is the area of, of energy, energy in general, and energy storage uh, and distribution for mobility in general. I am going to give a quite gen general talk in some aspects of batteries that are not so commonly spoken, but uh, that will become very, very, very important in the very near future. Okay, I will talk about hybrid materials because most of the anodes and cathodes and electrolytes are hybrid materials composed of at least three different materials and also in the relevance of solid state uh, approaches for batteries and in particular for printable batteries because they will play a very 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 important role in particular in the, in the area of sustainability okay uh, we are in the middle of something very beautiful what is called a revolution in the fourth industrial revolution basically determined by digitalization fast communication and interrelations of machine machines and persons persons and persons 
typically through informatics and electronics. And all of this has to be powered. This, uh, let's say, revolution is unstoppable. This um, revolution is based on new materials. We are very well aware of the impact that materials and processing technologies has in the environment. And in this uh, beautiful scenario in which we are, we have to do all these trans technological transitions by reducing the environmental impact that we are causing to the planet. That means that we do need new materials and advanced fabrication methods to improve interactivity, to make more efficient materials and processes, and to improve sustainability. For that, uh, for example, in the European framework, Green Deal and digitalization are one of the two most important keywords for the next seven years of research, of technology, and of funding. So, as we say, in particular in BC materials, that we work on materials for a better life, now we really do need materials for a sustainable and better life. And energy comes here as a problem and as a solution. A problem because we are using increasingly amounts of energy. A problem because we are using energy in a completely different form, highly distribution all over the planet, all in our pockets, all in our houses, all in our cars. Okay, energy and mobility are becoming increasingly associated. We know how to generate a strong effort has been applied to generate environmental friendly energy. Okay. Uh, we know how to transfer this energy by the power lines, also in a highly efficient way, but we still have to improve energy storage for mobility, in particularly for the applications related to mobility, electric cars, smart gadgets. Okay. And particularly important because this will be a great deal of the energy that we are going to use. For energy storage, we are working in a lot of technologies, as the previous speaker talk, as Anna Braga also introduced, Maria Elena Braga with the sodium. But at the moment, the best thing we do have is lithium ion batteries. And this is true, and this will, will be the truth for the next many years, because until we discover suitable materials, we process the materials in reliable ways, and we put the production facilities to do that in reliable ways, it will take a long time, okay? So for the rest, for the moment, the best thing we do have is ion batteries. And I talk about this, the Internet of Things is demanding an increasing number of a small distributed, highly distributed energy um, powering devices. We will have over 50 million interconnected things, and at least it's expected that half of those has to be have to be powered by very small portable devices. And this is a huge need, and this can be a huge environmental problem. And sensing is the basic of digitalization. Sensing has to be ubiquitous. Sensing will be a service, okay? The internet of things, the machine learning, the environment 4.0, the industry 4.0 need data. Okay, the data provided by sensors that the sensor has to be powered and ubiquitously distributed. By the way, this is also an area that is strongly increasing in terms also of uh, market size. So it's also a very good opportunity for working for many of the students of colleagues that we have uh, in watching here in, to this guy. It's one of the most important emerging areas in the field. And how we can power and even communicate the data of a sensor that is somewhere we have just two possibilities. Either with energy harvesting from the environment, strong efforts are being performed, energy harvest is increased, but still limited for specific locations, for specific environments in which this energy can be harvested. And typically we are moving in a few microwatts to really very few milliwatts in the best cases scenario. Okay, and typically we have to power things more than that. And there come batteries, okay? And the con conventional button batteries are not a solution, are not a solution 
because the environmental impact of those is huge and because they are not tailored to the sensors and the devices typically they are being used. Okay, so it is also a waste. Okay, so batteries and in particularly printable batteries are increasingly and heavily being investigated as a possibility to this self power or these autonomous sense uh, batteries systems that we are implemented, increasingly implemented. Printing technologies, um, which is additive manufacturing, is strongly increasing in all areas, also in the area of batteries. It is not a new technology, actually is for many one of the most impressive technologies developed in the last 1000 years, because the invention of the printing press basically changed culture, basically changed intellectuality, basically changed the promotion of information. And nowadays also can change a lot, can change a lot through the printable, materials, printable electronics, and printable and storage systems. So maybe we are in the second revolution related with printed technologies. Which is the difference between the time of Gutenberg and our time is that we can print a lot of materials. Printed technologies have evolved. They are very mature. But the huge difference in the amount of materials and the variety of materials and the variety of the properties of materials that we can print nowadays, OK? Uh, and this is really changing everything, including in the area of energy. Basically, by printing, what we have is, in most of the cases, not in all of the cases, hybrid materials. Soluble polymers with or nanomaterials mixed up in a suitable solvent and with a printing technologies with resolutions down to 10 to 20 micrometers to make a huge variety of different devices. It is not an easy task, okay? Basically, because we have to solve three things at a time, okay? For a given application, we have to take into consideration, first of all, the printing technology, okay? The printing technology, we put, we place a huge restrictions on the inks that we can print, but also the substrate in which we are going to print, okay? And this is something that we have to do at the same time. I just want to pay the attention of that fact because it is not good to optimize an ink. You have to optimize an ink for a printing technology and for a specific substrate. Okay, or you have to optimize the substrate if you already have the ink and the printing technology. Okay, and there is another very interesting issue here. And it is that you are interested in the solid, you are interested in what you print, but the process is basically made from a liquid or a fluid. But this is also a very, very, very interesting and demanding physics, physical chemistry that has to be mastered. How I pro suitably uh, process a uh, liquid so that at the end I have a solid with the functional properties that I need, that I want. Okay, so a very nice and interesting area. There is a large variety, not just a variety of printing technologies, each of them imposed in a specific. Uh, demands to the device in terms, for example, of viscosity, of, um, of the maximum size of the particles you can print on the resolution that you will have in the substrate that you are going to do. And this is something that you have to take into account whenever you are going to do something uh, with printing technologies, in this case, with printable battery. For batteries, basically, we're, the most used are screen printing, Extrusion and FDM. FDM is from the melt. Extrusion typically can be from the melt or for the from a liquid form, let's say, and screen printing is from a liquid. And we have a very nice um, capability of do fully integrated all printable device, particularly important in the area of sensors, because you can do a full device, a printable sensor with an integrated battery that you can place wherever you want, and that can be, for example, for agriculture 4.0, fully degradable after a specific amount of time. Also very important in this area is that not all the batteries are needed from the same time. Batteries for biomedical devices, you need them for three seconds to 10 minutes. Battery for uh, following a specific, um, for the food chains, maybe from three days to one month, and batteries for agriculture or environmental, environment 4.0, agriculture 4.0, from two months up to six months. Okay. And this is something that has to be provided by batteries too. Okay. 
batteries, printed batteries still the best among the best lithium ion batteries. There are also batteries in work with other with other chemistry. Okay, as we have here, nickel, zinc, silver. Um, many advantages as the flexibility, being compact, portable, very easy to produce and to integrate is also very important. You can deslocalize, deslocalize the production of the batteries. They can fabricate, be fabricated for very small scale to huge, large scale devices, okay? And it can be made out of sustainable materials and with sustainable processing, including water-based processing. The disadvantages, the cost actually is not low through decreasing. Uh, the manufacturing is not optimized yet. So when this came and it's coming to a highly demanded production scale, it will be optimized. And we need a lot of new inks and materials to do it. Otherwise, it's a very interesting scientific, but also technological and also economic area, as I have in the in the bottom part of the slide, okay, the area of flexible pins and thin film batteries is steadily and hugely increases in the future. What is a, a printable battery? A printed battery is a battery. So it's exactly the same as any other batter, battery. You need the anode, the cathode, and the separator. Nothing like that. And it can be based exactly in the same materials as the batteries that all the colleagues have been talking before or will talk later. Lithium is selected in most of the cases because of the well-known characteristics, basically uh, the energy density, okay, and the power density, allowing to make all these uh, small, lightweight, portable devices. And we do have exactly the same problems as lithium-ion batteries have. The solid electrolyte interface, the volumetric expansion, the formation of the lithium dead drive, and in this case, not the safety issues, because typically, in this area, which is the electrolytes are becoming increasingly better, better developed. Some of these issues are not very important in the area of printable batteries because you have batteries, as I told before, that can go from 10 minutes duration time up to six months duration time. Okay, so in this case, processability and sustainability are more important, of course, together with reliability than durability, which is not a key issue in these areas that we have. So what is new in these areas with respect to the issues that all my colleagues have been talking? And I will focus only on what is specific in this, in this area. Basically, the materials are very similar. So new materials are coming here because we do not need specifically high-performance materials. Of course, the simulation as everything nowadays with machine learning and artificial intelligence are very, very important is two slides just to design the proper materials because in this area, different to many others, we have really the necessary tool to make a full account of all the processing having in a battery, which is a very, very, very simple device with three layers, okay, and in which basically the ionic conductivity play the major role, of course there are many others, but this is the main important one, and we can perform very interesting a simulation to discover the new materials that we want to apply. And then we have to develop hybrid materials because typically when we want to develop anode and cathode, we need the active material, typically conducting materials through this is becoming less and less used because we are developing polymer binders or binders that have already increasingly adequate interface characteristics and interface properties not to need the conductive additive. And we have to mix them up. And we have to mix them up with an appropriate viscosity, with an appropriate rheology to be able to be printed while maintaining in the solid state the suitable electrochemical properties or of course the possible the, the safety. The most used also in this area printed materials continue to be the lithium one, LFP, LMNO, LCO. Okay. And here what it comes different to any other one is the compatibility between the materials during the processing and how I change from the liquid to the solid state through the rheology of the material, through the rheology of the ink, okay? And also very important, okay? Typically they are built up in layer by layer approach. And of course, for that, what you need is that the second layer 
not only is compatible with the first layer, but most important that it do not destroy the first layer because you have to, you must have, as in any battery, very well, very good interfacial characteristics in order to allow uh, ion migration and charge and discharge processes. Okay. The most important thing here is one of the most important things is the rheology, and the rheology depends strongly on the selection of the four component that it not there is not just the active material, it is not just the polymer binder, it is not the conductive additive, it is the solvent that you use, preferably water, but it is not so developed in most of the cases. So we continue to use organic solvents. The best ones are not particularly environmental friendly, like NMP, they typically use, for example, for fluorinated polymers, which are the most used uh, polymers for polymer band binders in conventional batteries that we do not know if they will be reduced in the future because they are the best. And nowadays they are already being obtained with the two most important characteristics nowadays from green chemistry approaches and with recyclability characteristics, despite of having fluoride, they are going to be for a while with us. So it is important to focus in the solvent and also green solvents like DMPO are being developed that are not, let's say, green, uh, green solvent, but they are uh, light yellow solvents, okay? Not red solvents with environmental impact. And this is very, very important. Then the characteristic of the solvent that you are going to use to control the rheology, to control the compatibility between the different um, elements and between the different layers and also the behavior when you introduce uh, the specific amount that we have here of the um, of the active material change in a different way depending on the solvent you have so you have not only polymer binder active material interaction but also the interaction is determined by the solvent the rheology is determined by the solvent and the final structure and microstructure is determined by the solvent okay um, but at the end, you get printed cathodes, in this case, with these very beautiful characteristics that not only are really important for printed batteries, but also for the regular batteries, most of the, um, of the cathodes are going to, are starting to be also uh, implemented in this way, okay? Also very, very important, we have uh, ten, five more minutes, I guess, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, is the selection of the polymer binder. The selection of the polymer binder is very important for the processability, okay, but also for what nowadays is called the interface engineering. Most of the problems in all batteries, but also in printed batteries, is the problems that occur at the interfaces, okay? Not only interface in the interfaces between anodes and cathodes, okay, uh, anodes and electrolyte or electrolyte and cathode, but also in the interface in the hybrid material itself. So what it is very interesting nowadays, and one of the main research areas, for example, in cathode development, beyond the discovery of new materials, of course, also heavily investigated, is to perform proper interface engineering with the materials that we do have. Because we have enough issues to be solved and the interfaces that can strongly increase the capabilities and characteristics of the materials that we have and the batteries that we have to really reach the nominal uh, power densities and energy densities that in some cases we are far from there. And here you have an example in how just changing the number of fluors in the fluorinated polymer binder, how the characteristics, for example, the Coulombic efficiency of the batteries change from 60% for to basically 100%. Okay, basically doing this interfacing, proper interfacing between the active materials between the active materials and the polymer binder. Okay. Okay. And once you have that, you can prepare the anodes, cathodes, and print the full batteries with wonderful characteristics, very similar to the ones that you have, can prepare by non printed methods. Okay. And um, in an environmental friendly way, being able to miniaturize, being able to have in a huge variety of application possibilities. One of the most important areas, nevertheless, and it is being addressed by everybody, but in particularly in the area of printed batteries, is the 
electrolytes. Electrolytes is the most problematic part in the batteries, basically because it uses liquid electrolytes. Okay, so the problem to be solved to batteries really to do, as you say, next generation batteries is to solve the issues with the polymer electrolytes. It has been a huge amount of work by doing porous membranes for the electrolyte of a huge variety of different materials, mater of polymers basically, materials that have been prepared um, with fillers to improve the compatibility with the with electrolytes uh, from natural materials to increase sustainability and so on. But at the end, all of this is always the same. The way in which we increase uh, the characteristics of the electro of the separator is, is low, actually. Okay. It's not even a small evolution. Okay. It is by far not a revolution. So basically, the separator that we have nowadays are basically very similar to the ones we have at the beginning, despite the huge amount of work in different polymers and in different fillers to improve that. The true real revolution will come either by doing new liquid electrolytes or at the best to get rid of these electrolytes and do the solid electrolytes. And this seems to be an easy problem, okay? Because at the end, the only thing that we want to do is to control the electronic conductivity Sorry, the ionic conductivity of the materials, okay? That is very well characterized and very well known. And we have a lot of very nice theories for all of this. But physics here is, is complicated. First of all, we have very nice conductors, uh, ionic conductors that when they are dissolved, they have a very low conductivity, but in the solid state is incredibly low, okay? And somehow we are not able to tune the three main parameters that control the ionic conductivity of the materials, the charge of the ions, the mobility, and let's say the concentration that we have. We are approaching very good to the characteristics that we need for the solid electrolytes with the ceramics, but they have production issues, stability issues, and compatibility issues at the interfaces, and Heavy load is very in place <clears throat> in polymer solid electrolytes. Okay. Basically, polymers in cell systems and polymers with ionic liquid systems sometimes combine with 2D materials in order to prepare the proper channels for that. We are almost there. Okay. But still, most of the good results are good at temperatures, temperatures about. 50 degrees, 60 degrees, maybe 45. And what we need is proper solid, elect uh, solid electrolytes at room temperature. The most suitable approach, or many of the good approaches, are coming through printing technologies by the compatibilization of polymers, okay, with uh, ionic liquids or salts, okay. And as I say again, with um, fast ionic conductors that provide the channels for the orientation in the conductivity of the ions uh, that have to move from the anodes for the cathode. It's a very, very interesting area, one of the most interesting areas nowadays that again, if it is solved in any of the sub areas, like it is being done at the rest in printable batteries, will come certainly to the other kind of batteries as the main paradigm change in the development of batteries. The other two very important areas that solid electrolytes will provide is also the capability of introducing sensing capabilities and self-healing capabilities, because many of the materials that we are using in this area, that it is UV coreable materials and phase changing materials, have the possibility also to provide information and also self-healing capabilities. The most important and differential area uh, of printable batteries that can provide that any other technology can provide is the free form batteries. Is to have batteries in whatever form we want to better integrate into devices. And now two minutes to read the most important issues with respect to green, to the green approach to batteries. Uh, it is true one thing. Probably there is much more, much more lithium than we think we are. Because now we're looking for that and we are increasingly finding lithium in many countries in which they didn't know that they had lithium, okay? So there is more that we think. So it wouldn't be a problem in the near future. 
but it is clear that the perspective indicates that the use of lithium will increase probably more than the global lithium resources that we have nowadays. But even if it is not, the most important in this area is recycling, because a battery is not an environmental friendly device. It is not by far, and it is not because of the element that is used, because of the combination of elements that it has, and because of the um, hard environmental conditions in which the recycling is done. So it has to be done, it has to be considered from the very beginning, but it is not a particularly environmental friendly technology. It is in the use, but it is not in the production, and it is not in the recycling. And due to the eventual a huge growth of use and let's see how limited resources what is important is to start with the recycling technologies from the very beginning or to change the paradigm again at least for 40 percent of the batteries that we are going to use related with using time from two to six months okay to to eco design of the batteries in a completely circular economy approach, okay? This is possible nowadays for batteries up to six months, I say, not toxic renewable bio-based materials, okay? Basically with energy and cost-efficient methods, printable technologies, designed for the use, designed for biomedical applications, designed for tracking or designed for agriculture, and that at the end, they can effectively disappear and recycle together with the medical device, together with the box, or together with the environmental issue. We do have approaches for that. Very beautiful, by the way, as you can see here, fully degradable batteries, fully composed of organic materials, and that at the end, they biodegrade after use. So it is important to consider these new power paradigms that can also Perform and this is a very nice project we are running. Uh, can be also a possibility for many areas to develop. Okay, communities in in Mexico is in this case that use the materials that are not used for the development of coffee. Okay, for performing also in industry related to batteries, low power, low durability, but applicable batteries that can be used uh, in a sustainable and recyclable way. So to finish, energy storage systems are essential for a sustainable world, are essential for digitalization, are essential for mobility. It will increase a lot. We have to consider sustainable batteries and sustainable approaches for the very beginning. These new materials and concepts have to be implemented from now on. It has not to be thought just in performance, and we did in the other, um, let's say, technological revolutions that we had uh, over time. And now we have to think about that from the very beginning. And printable batteries and solid electrolytes are a very important part, part of this future for improving integration and for flexible batteries and for low durability batteries. Thank you very much also for the people that work with us, the people that find us, and thank you very much to you all for being there, and Paulo and the other colleagues for Portugal and Austin for invitation. Mm -hmm. Thank you, uh, uh, Nancho, uh, for his, uh, this great presentation, and you touch on uh, a very different uh, point mm -hmm. of, uh, of this, uh, of this uh, uh, topic. Uh, I don't know if the, the floor is open for questions. I don't know if there is anything. Uh, uh, Elena, yeah, please. I have a question, but if someone else has. <laughs> I'm asking all, a lot of questions, but very interesting to uh, talk. Thank you, uh, I actually want to ask you a, a couple of questions. First of all, um, do you print in? I, I I believe that you print in a in a in a in a, in a inert atmosphere, no? Or or because it you depends. are printing lithium. By the way, as you know, Elena is an expert in ionic conductors that can provide the <laughs> solutions of many of the problems that I have talked about. Yeah, <laughs> so we, we we can discuss that later. 
<laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, that's true. And this is a pleasure and very nice. Thank to you. It's a pleasure you meeting you too. Yeah, it depends. It depends, on Elena. It depends on the chemistry. I mean, some of them, of course, the, the ones that are lithium-based, we print directly in the, in the glow box. But the latest that I have used, um, they use redox species that you can print basically in any place, and they any are place. activated by the inclusion of the of the active species in the battery whenever you need the battery. And then yeah, they last for the time they last. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The other thing is, is can I you want only to say before answer, this is a very important, I only want to remark this. Mm -hmm. uh, we are dealing here with a very specific market, but again, mm -hmm. that is a huge market, a mm -hmm. huge market. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. No, you know, they, they are starting to have printers to print almost everything, big yeah. pieces and, and in the industry. So batteries is is actually something that should be 3d printed for mm -hmm. sure so can you print can you have uh, ethanol for example as a as a as a, a, a ink uh, solvent or mm -hmm. a, Very good question and, too. yeah sorry yeah. sorry just a second and and if you if you can you what is the maximum temperature at which you can print uh, mm -hmm. very very good question in fact uh, for many of the technologies screen printing inkjet printing direct ink printing aerosol printing the correct selection of the solvent is the key for a suitable printing it determines okay. not just the rheology as i said but in many cases also the addition to the substrate and the mm -hmm. final morphology of the printing of the printed pattern, mm -hmm. okay? Solving evaporation and curing, mm -hmm. it, is, um, it is clear for that. So that means that we have learned basically to print with any solvent, including ethanol, mm -hmm. basically mm -hmm. any solvent. Fast and very rapidly evaporated solvent and solvents that evaporate much, much slower in order to have more precise mm -hmm. uh, morphologies. Um, for example, the velocity with which the solvent evaporates determines the crystallinity and the addition of the polymer binder. This is very important, or the crystallinity of the solid electrolyte. That's why it is very important that an ethanol is a very important solvent because it's a well-known solvent that, that allows us to, uh, to control, let's say, or to know the final properties that the device with that the polymer will have. So we can we can do mm -hmm. that. About the printing, we hope we always want to do the printing at room temperature, but we can print up to 250 degrees mm -hmm. easily. Mm -hmm. Now uh, printing technologies are evolving much rapid than mm -hmm. Than, than printable materials, and we have bought right now an aerosol printing to 3D printing um, ceramics. And in principle, they say that we can print it mm. up to 350. Let's see. Okay. Very interesting. The other thing I saw that you had meta batteries, I thought that's very interesting. Uh, mm -hmm. But are they really meta batteries or they are meta capacitors? It look, you know, the, 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 Maybe they are more of, you know, if I don't know what is the, the materials that you have there, but I would imagine that if you have kind of like two metals with an electrolyte in the middle, this would be more, you know, like a metal, but a metal capacitor, but the principles aren't the same anyway, but it yeah, is exactly. very interesting. <laughs> this is something that I say also with my, sometimes maybe we are not using the right names for the right things, but uh, yeah. that is an energy storage system. Yeah, okay. we are using the name the people want us to use. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> what we do have is a system that stores energy exactly. and then release the energy all, over time in the time we want, in, in principle, sometimes through the electrochemical reactions, sometimes, as you are the expert, also through dipolar relaxations yeah. assisting the device, but at the end is the energy storage and release over time. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Sorry, Paolo, for polarizing. Thank you. No, that's okay. Uh, I'm wondering. <laughs> and I hope, then. because I have been with Elena a couple of times, that sometimes we meet either in Braga or in Porto and finally have a coffee 
together. That's and good. Think about that's good. You are okay. welcome to my life. <laughs> um, uh, let me see if there is any questions. Okay, if not, and also for the sake of time, uh, let's just close here. So, uh, on behalf of the organization of this masterclass, I would like to thank the speakers, uh, uh, audience uh, for attending, and of course uh, the questions, and also for the UT Austin. Uh, Portugal program for their leadership. Um, it's clear from this masterclass that the demand for batteries will exponentially grow, and uh, uh, particularly for the uh, the e, uh, e mobility, uh, there are still many challenges to be addressed. It seems uh, in order to achieve uh, more market penetration, better battery performance, lower costs. And so uh, this is a, uh, there's a lot of work that needs to be done. I think today we heard from uh, Professor Guya Yu uh, discussing the synthesis of uh, porous nano extractors they use on batteries and their advantage of uh, improving uh, the connection across the electrode and increasing overall capacity. Then we heard uh, from Professor Elena Braga uh, about harvesting technologies, complex systems, and even using the car's body panels as the battery themselves I think this will be a neat thing. Uh, then we, we heard from uh, Manthi Ram, who, who first provided an overview of the various types of batteries, their applications, and, and it was clear that in the future, there will be various uh, battery technologies depending on the task to be performed, and even uh, per, uh, perhaps on the country where these batteries are going to operate. And then finally, uh, not least, of course, we heard from Professor Lancers who discussed Another dimension in the field of batteries related with the digitalization. It's clear that we'll need the uh, thin film batteries um, to be integrated in various types of devices. And with that, uh, I think we, we will close here and um, hope to see you uh, in another venue. And uh, thanks uh, to everyone again. Thank you. Thank you very much. Congratulations. Thank you, Paulo. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.